Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In the name of God, the most gracious, the most merciful. Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulillah. In this series, we mention a few thoughts about the supplication of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which is authentically narrated. La ilaha illallah, wahdahu la sharika lah, lahu al-mulk, wa lahu al-hamd, wa huwa ala kulli shayin qadir. The translation is, there is no God but Allah, alone, without partner. His is the kingdom, to him is all praise, and he has power over all things. We will divide this supplication into five sections. The first is, there is no God but Allah. We will dis discuss the existence of Allah, his lordship, and the fact that he is a deity, and one who is worthy of worship. And the second part will be regarding the oneness of Allah. Uh, he is Allah alone, without partner. Uh, the third part of the discussion would be regarding his kingship. As the Prophet ﷺ said, his is the kingdom. The fourth part would be regarding his perfection, which is when the Prophet said, to him is all praise. And finally, the fifth part would be regarding Allah's omnipotence, that his power includes and encompasses all things, which is in the statement of the Prophet ﷺ, he has power over all things, which is basically from the Qur'an. Regarding the question of existence, we will mention that the fact that Allah is a God means that He is the Creator and that therefore He is the one worthy of worship. So, Tawheed al which means that Allah is the only Lord, Creator and Maintainer of all things, necessitates the Tawheed of Uluhiyyah, which is the fact that Allah alone deserves to be worshipped. That he is the only true deity, uh, God, and object of worship. So regarding Allah's existence and his lordship, uh, the fact that he created all things, one of the most powerful arguments for it is the argument from contingency. And the argument begins by looking around in the world and within ourselves, and realizing that we are all dependent on external causes and conditions. So the human being needs to eat and drink. We are all in need of sustenance. We need company, we need to get married, we depend on our parents when we are young, and then our parents depend on us when we grow up. These are all types of dependency within the natural world, which we experience directly. And the more we look in the world, the more we see that everything around us is dependent on external conditions. So the argument uh, begins with this premise, which is uh, that there exist contingent things. And then... The argument goes on to say that the entirety of those contingent things must also be contingent. I mean, the more the things you include within the entirety of contingent things, the more the entirety will depend on an external cause. If you add a contingent thing to another contingent thing, the two together will not be less contingent. In fact, they will be more contingent than each on their own. And no matter how many contingent things you add to the set, even if you have an infinite set of successive contingent things, the whole entirety will be cont contingent on an external cause. The more the contingent things you add, the more the cause for those contingent things is required. Uh, so there must be a cause for the set of all contingent things, uh, and since that cause is outside of the set, it must not be contingent, otherwise it would be within the set. And since it is not contingent, it must be necessary, that is, it must necessarily exist and must be absolutely independent of all things. So that is the contingency argument, basically. It is a sound argument, uh, and there are certain things to be said about this argument, but we leave that for another time, inshallah. The other thing I wish to note is that contingency is mutually concomitant with the fact of origination. And by origination, we mean that something begins to exist after it does not exist. So when we say that this human being is contingent, that necessitates that this human being once did not exist, his substance was not there, uh, and then he began to exist. So every contingent thing is an originated thing. Uh, and this makes no difference when you consider the whole universe, the current universe, I mean. If you consider the entirety of atoms and substances which currently exist, that whole entirety uh, must have begun to exist after it did not exist, because it is contingent. 
Now many people think that origination can only mean ex nihilo origination. Uh, they do not conceive of any type of origination that is ex material. They think that origination has to be without preceding material conditions. So because they, because they see nothing coming into existence ex nihilo, they are misled into thinking that the universe could be eternal and the matter may always be there. They incline towards denying origination and then claiming that the universe is necessary in order to maintain the mutual concomitance between origination and contingency. <clears throat> so they adopt the origination of the world and then they adopt the contingency of the world. When in fact, the origination of the world need not be ex nihilo. There is another type of origination, which is when a substance comes into existence after it was not existent at all, but that coming into existence must have been out of a preceding condition. We're speaking about a third category of creation, which is neither ex nihilo creation nor a rearrangement of already existing matter. So if you think about ex nihilo creation, it is the origination of a substance without any preceding conditions, whereas the rearrangement of matter is the reconfiguration of, of the same things into new forms. So the ex nihilo creation is a substantial origination, whereas the rearrangement of matter does not involve substantial origination. And the rearrangement of already existing matter implies that the prior iteration of matter is necessary for the subsequent form to come into existence. Whereas the ex nihilo creation, by definition, entails that there was no preceding material condition for the substantial origination to take place. So if it re is originated ex nihilo, it comes into existence after its non-existence without there being any preceding thing from which it comes to be. Uh, what Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah suggests is that there is a third type of creation which is an origination ex materia. Uh, this origination is similar to ex nihilo creation in that the origination is substantial, so the very substance comes into existence. But it is similar to the rearrangement of matter in that the originated substance requires the existence of a preceding material condition uh, which is annihilated entirely at the time and place of the origination. And this prior material is necessary for the substantial origination to take place. So when Allah creates the tree, He necessarily prepares the elements of the tree before. He prepares the earth, He prepares the material conditions, and from them He originates the tree into existence. He substantially originates the tree while annihilating that prior material condition, which served as a necessary condition for the tree to come into existence. So this third position is neither an ex nihilo creation nor a rearrangement of matter. It is Allah bringing things into existence after they were not there at all, but He brings them into existence after preparing prior necessary conditions which are annihilated when the subsequent effect is brought into existence. Allah is always bringing one thing into existence out of another thing. So basically, if we maintain the contingency of everything in the world, then that is concomitant with the fact that every part of the world must have come into existence after it did not exist, that there is a substantial origination in every part of the world. And since the contingency and originatedness are mutually concomitant, they can both serve as two independent evidences that always come together uh, for the divine cause who is eternal and necessary, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now there is the question of ex nihilo creation. Is it possible or impossible? Uh, there were traditional Muslim scholars who held that creation ex nihilo is possible, and there were other traditional scholars who argued that ex nihilo creation is impossible. One of whom was Ibn Taymiyyah. Uh, actually, he is the only one we know of. Uh, he argued that creation ex nihilo is impossible. Now, regardless, uh, it is irrational to maintain that something which is created out of an element can also be created without that element. And this shouldn't be disputed. If we consider the example of a water molecule, 
we understand that it is originated from the elements which are hydrogen and oxygen. We can't say that the water comes into existence without these prior elements. And since the hydrogen and oxygen are elements from which the water molecule is created, it means that the hydrogen and oxygen are necessary conditions for water as we know it. Uh, this shouldn't be disputed. However, the early Muslims may not necessarily have believed that everything is originated ex materia, particularly because they were not able to see the simple elements being brought into existence. So perhaps they could be of the kind of thing which is brought into existence without prior conditions. So in this view of ex nihilo creation, Allah commences the creation of the world by originating simple substances ex nihilo. And then he uses these necessary conditions in order to originate more complex and compound substances such as animals and trees and the many phenomena we see around us that originate from uh, simple substances. So this is one of the theologically acceptable views regarding Allah's act of creation, namely that he creates the simple substances ex nihilo and then uses them to create more complex creations such that these simple substances are necessary conditions for the compound creations which are created from these simple elements. Now, Ibn Taymiyyah once held this view, but he later became convinced that ex nihilo creation is impossible, absolutely. Uh, and the reason he believed that ex nihilo creation is impossible, such that even the simple elements must be created out of prior conditions, is that he became convinced that the possibility of the origination of a substance is an ontological attribute uh, and is not something conceptual. And since the possibility is an ontological attribute, it must be predicated of a prior substance. So let's say that a tree originates. This origination must have been possible prior to the tree existing. Now, the possibility of this origination is an ontological attribute, and so it must be predicated of, it must subsist in something preceding the tree, something before the tree, the earth substance. Uh, the earth substance carried the potential for the tree to come into existence. It carried the possibility of the origination of the tree. Without that preceding substance, the tree cannot be possible. Rather, the tree will either be impossible, in which case it would not exist, or it will be necessary, in which case it would be eternal and uncreated. In this view, Allah is perpetually preparing material conditions and originating subsequent effects by His will and power. Uh, this view is much closer to the modern scientific view because we understand today that the elementary particles are not created ex nihilo. It is now understood that quarks and electrons and the subatomic particles come into existence out of radiation, that is out of photons, and these photons come into existence out of energies in the surrounding body, such as potential and kinetic energy. Out of these energies, Allah originates photons or light, and from the light, Allah creates the matter particles, which are the quarks and the leptons, and, and consequently, the later, more compound substances. I personally believe that Ibn Taymiyyah's view should be presented as an alternative view to the common view that ex nihilo creation is possible, because it gives room for scientists who are convinced of the impossibility of creation ex nihilo uh, to believe in the Creator as a being who is independent of all things, and the Creator of all things who is perpetually preparing things and originating subsequent effects. So that is the argument for Allah's existence. You can't have contingent things without a necessary being, because the more contingent things you include within the set, the more the set will need the necessary cause. Likewise, you can't have an infinite number of things coming into existence and going out of existence in succession without there being an eternal originator who brings them into existence and removes them from existence in succession. For every originated thing, there must be the eternal originator, and for every contingent thing, there must be the necessary cause, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that is regarding the question uh, of Allah's existence. Now, there is a point to mention here about uh, the regress um, of material conditions. Um, as we've seen, the infinite regress of material conditions is not impossible according to Ibn Taymiyyah. Uh, it is a permissible type of regress. And this is in contrast to the regress of creators and originators, 
which is impossible uh, as is demonstrated through the contingency argument. So if you have contingent things, you can't have only contingent things. You must have a necessary cause who causes uh, these contingent things. Likewise, you can't have a regress of originators. That is, a substance created by another substance, created by another substance, ad infinitum in an infinite chain of originators. However, you can have a regress of material conditions and, and secondary causes, as uh, secondary causes uh, uh, and secondary natural conditions. Uh, that is possible if the regress of secondary causes owes its existence to the eternal originator. So you can't have a regress of originators, but you can have you can have a regress of secondary causes that owes its its existence to the eternal and independent originator. The secondary causation is the means by which Allah creates the subsequent effects. And this regress of secondary causes does not contradict the fact of Allah's omnipotence and independence of all things. Uh, indeed, Allah is independent of the secondary causes, meaning he is not assisted by these secondary causes in his creation of the subsequent effects. Uh, this does not mean, however, that the secondary causes are superfluous. The secondary causes are necessary for the subsequent effects to take place. So Allah must prepare a secondary cause or material condition in order to create the subsequent effect. But this does not mean that Allah depends on another thing. Rather, this regress of secondary conditions is a consequence of Allah's creative act. More clearly, if we say that Allah's creation of the tree requires the creation of the suitable material beforehand, that is in fact saying that Allah's act is conditioned on Allah's act. The later act is not assisted by the material condition because that material condition is itself created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if we assume that everything in the world is created ex materia in this way, that is, if we assume that each thing in the chain of contingent things comes from, from a prior contingent thing, which serves as a, as a material condition for it, uh, there will be more reason to believe in the absolute contingency of everything, uh, and of every part of the natural world. Something which comes into existence out of prior material conditions is more dependent on Allah than something which comes into existence ex nihilo. Um, so if we say that Allah creates everything out of another thing by his will and power, then everything will be even more dependent on Allah than if we assume that some things were originated uh, without prior conditions. Like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, did we not create you out of a despised fluid? Likewise, Allah mentions that we were created in our mother's wombs in stages. This is a great evidence for our contingency. Uh, and Allah says, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ Say, He is Allah who is one. Allah who is Samad. Allah, the independent. لَمْ يَلِدْ وَلَمْ يُولَدْ Meaning, He has neither an origin nor an offspring. He doesn't have a father or a son. So, if everything within the contingent world depends on a material origin and annihilates into something else, then there is more reason to believe that it is unlike Allah and is all the more contingent and dependent on Allah uh, than if it were created without prior material conditions uh, or out of nothing. And Allah says, وَلَمْ يَكُلْ لَهُ كُفْوًا أَحَدْ uh, There is none equivalent to him. Obviously, he is the eternal and necessary being. And we are all originated and dependent on his existence. Subhanahu wa ta'ala, we cannot exist for a moment without Allah keeping us in existence and sustaining our existence. Uh, so this is regarding the first part of the question uh, on Allah's existence. In the next part, we, we will speak more about the Tawheed of Uluhiyyah, or um, the fact that Allah subhanahu, subhanahu wa ta'ala alone deserves worship. Um, and um, uh, that will be on the question of Allah's oneness, inshallah. So we finish from the part which says, there is no God but Allah. And inshallah, we will, we will go into the second part which says, وحده لا شريك له وصلى الله على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا